Uh, I'd like to start uh, by outlining the key definitions and legislation uh, that are involved in this. So first, the Data Protection Act. This defines direct marketing by talking about advertising or marketing material. The key thing to take away is that it does cover promotional material. So promotion of charitable aims and fundraising, so not just commercial marketing and advertising. So if what you're doing involves personal information, so contact details, when and where people studied, their interests, their career, then the Data Protection Act apply. Second, it's not just data protection law we need to look at. We also have to look at the rather snappily titled uh, Privacy and Electronic Communication Regulations. These deal with un unsolicited direct marketing. So marketing that has not been previously sought or asked for by an individual. The regulation works alongside and complements the Data Protection Act uh, by giving more detail on electronic communications and greater protection for individuals. It is worth noting that the regulation covers the full range of communications, so that telephone calls, emails, texts and if you are still using them for fundraising the good old fax machine so a bit of boring definition to start off with but we'll get into some more detail now what we'll do we'll look into the detail of all the issues that a uk-based organization must consider when looking to fundraise and i'll start by looking at fundraising within the uk so the key is fairness that is the underlying principle that sort of drives everything that you're looking to do. You need to be thinking, what are the reasonable expectations of the people we are looking to approach? These should be defined by the fair processing or privacy notices that you give the individual at the point they provide their details to you. This is to comply with the first data protection principle, which is all about fairness and transparency. It's all about ensuring individuals know who you are, what will happen to their personal information, and where they have a choice, such as receiving marketing, being able to exercise that choice. Now, it is becoming more and more critical to have clear proof of this, to have on record you know, when their data was collected, what they were told it would be used for, and any consent we may have given and also the source of any information if you brought in a list from somewhere else. This is so if the individual challenges you, if they challenge why they are receiving marketing material from you, you are able to provide a clear answer. You are able to say, yes, you did consent to this marketing on this date, whether it's via this online form or when you applied for a particular service. Another element to consider is how you maintain the accuracy of information. Now, this can be difficult, but considering what processes you have in place to try and keep the data accurate and up to date, and in turn, most useful and of value to you, is important. So it might be mailing out on an annual basis to ask individuals to verify or update their details, or it might be having clear processes for handling no longer at this address returns, or changes in marketing preference. So that's a very brief look at fundraising to UK-based individuals. But what if you want to tap into the potential pool of donors who are based outside the UK, who have a direct link to your institution or an indirect link via a partner, sister institution you're working with? Well, the first point to note is that if you contact them directly, so you contact them from within the UK, then there is no transfer of data, so we don't need to look at principle eight of the Data Protection Act. So if you collected an American student's personal email address when they studied in the UK, and you provided a privacy notice, meaning they expect to receive marketing from you, then you can email to them once they return to the US. However, if you don't have the data for that, if you're looking to partner with another institution to make that contact, then we do need to look at principle eight, because you will be transferring personal data to another institution based in another country 
who will be using that data on your behalf to make the contact. So let's have a look at principle eight. Principle eight exists because back even as far back as 1995, it was recognized that we live in a time where institutions, businesses can work with others that are not based uh, in their own country, who may even be based outside of Europe. Now, all organizations in countries within the European economic area must comply with the same core data protection legislation, which is the EU directive from 1995. What this means is that individuals who personal data is processed in the European economic area will benefit from a fairly consistent level of protection for their personal information and a core set of privacy rights. Principle 8 exists so individuals can clearly expect the same set of protections and rights if an organisation chooses to use another organisation to process, to handle information and that organisation happens to be based outside. The European economic area. Basically, the transfer of personal information to an organization based in a country outside of Europe cannot lead to a reduction in the protection of that data or to the weakening of privacy rights. That's the underlying aim of principle eight. So, when it comes to fundraising abroad, the first point to consider is are you actually looking to make a transfer of personal data to an institution? based in the US or another non-European country. If not, if the institution is based within an EEA country, then principle eight does not apply. So you can transfer personal data to an organization, institution based in Austria, Belgium, Bulgaria, etc. any of those countries on that list, and it will comply with principle eight. However, if you are looking to make a transfer of personal data to an institution based in the US or another, other non-EEA uh, country, fear not. The Data Protection Act does provide a number of different ways to make this happen. The first is to check whether the institution is based in one of the countries where the European Commission has already signed them off as providing adequate level of protection. You can see the list of current countries uh, in the top right of the screen. For US-based institutions, you can check whether the organization has signed up to the Safe Harbor Scheme. So the Safe Harbor Scheme is a sort of equivalent, uh, has an equivalent set of uh, security and uh, principles when it comes to managing personal data. Thirdly, you could also make your own assessment of the country's data protection rules and regulations and assess whether you consider them as providing adequate level of protection. So this is quite an appealing option. Uh, the Information Commissioner has given guidance on this and the legislation is quite clear. The first uh, asks you to assess general adequacy. Uh, it asks you to consider, among other things, you know, what security measures will be in place, what is the nature and extent of the information. The second set of criteria asks you to consider the legal adequacy. For example, whether the country has data protection laws, and whether an individual could actually enforce their rights if they needed to in the other country. So it is possible, it is open to you to make your own assessment of the country based on the ICO's criteria. And if you consider that the protections in place will be adequate, and I would recommend that you document that assessment in case of any scrutiny by the Information Commissioner or inquiry by an individual, then the transfer uh, could be deemed as compliant. Another option is to use a model contract clause when engaging the other institution to ensure they will follow your requirements and expectations when it comes to handling the personal information. We shall see in a moment that having some sort of documented agreement is essential for other aspects of uh, data protection compliance. So including the right clauses on transferring data outside the EEA could easily be part of this wider agreement. And finally, the final option is to look on which is individual consent. Now, consent is often uh, seen as critical, and it's not. As I've shown you, there are four other ways of uh, legitimizing a transfer of data outside the EEA. 
Consent is just one of the ways of doing that. Now, the consent doesn't have to be explicit. Uh, the Act says it's just consent, it's not explicit consent. But as I've argued earlier, having some record of, of uh, consent, some understanding, some proof is increasingly important. We really don't want to rely solely on verbal consent alone without any record, without anything to back it up. The key thing with consent is that people sometimes get it confused with fairness. Now, being open about what will happen to someone's personal information once they've provided it to you, so the fairness, the privacy notice, is not the same as seeking their fully informed, freely given consent for those activities to occur. So it's worth highlighting that because, because consent does seem to be given a lofty status sometime and regarded as the be all and end all, and, and it's not always. So, we now have a number of options to make a legitimate transfer of personal information to an institution based in a country outside the EEA. And as I said, ideally we can try and avoid having to rely on consent. There should be another basis that can legitimise that transfer. But there remains the need to ensure compliance with all the data protection principles. So having nailed uh, principle eight and principle one, the fairness principle, we do need to consider the wider uh, management of data when you're looking to fundraise abroad. It is very important to be clear about the purpose behind the transfer so that all sides are clear who will be doing what and to what end. It will also mean that you can be clear to individuals in your privacy notice about uh, the relationship you have with the other institution and what they will be doing with the individual's data. Thinking about the purpose also helps define the nature and extent of the data that the other institution will need to meet those defined objectives. And it should always be the minimum required to get the job done. And having accurate, relevant information is critical. And thinking about these issues at the point of process, at the point you're looking to exchange the data, will hopefully uh, remove the risk of causing a problem further down the line. You know, if there's a particular sensitivity around the individuals you're looking to approach, either because of their past conduct, that they left the uh, university under a cloud, the subject that they studied could be a sensitive topic, so you're, you know, there's a potential risk there, or you know, their current work in life, if they work for the military or some other institution where there's a sensitivity about their past, you know, trying to just think about these issues, think about the nature of the data, what it's going to be used for, who is going to be using it. You know, getting all this right up front is, is critical. The other aspect to consider is security. What security requirements you will have of the other institution when they are handling your personal information, the personal information you as an institution are responsible for. You need to be clear or receive clear assurances on the steps they will take to, you know, for example, protect the information and control access to it. You should define how you plan to share the data with them. You know, how are you going to ensure a secure exchange of data? Whether that's using you know, encrypted or password protected emails or spreadsheets or a secure fire transfer sites, there's various ways of ensuring a secure transfer of information rather than just attaching a spreadsheet to uh, email and it getting misdirected and sent where it should not have been sent. Also thinking about the end of the agreement as well, when your relationship with the other institution does come to an end, It's even more uh, critical since 2010, when the introduction of fines of up to half a million pounds for serious breaches of the Data Protection Act uh, came in. All these aspects in re reaching informed decisions and documenting them, both internally and with your partner institutions, is critical to managing the risks and ensuring you continue to reap the benefits of using personal data for fundraising. So this has been a, a sort of high level uh, overview of the key issues to consider. Uh, to uh, summarise, if you are starting now from a clean slate, 
my first thing would be to say, look at those privacy notices and fair processing notices and make sure they work for you. Make sure they inform individuals how you will use their personal information, include details of the relationships you will have with the sister and other institutions and any potential transfers of data. Be clear about the purposes for which their information will be used. Having some sort of documented uh, agreement or contract with the other institution that defines your requirements and expectations across all aspects of data protection. And if you are transferring data outside of the EEA, make sure you're clear on how you will achieve compliance, whether that's the individual's consent or one of the other options we've just looked at. Now, life rarely offers us a clean slate. So here are my uh, practical steps to reduce the risks if you are already in a relationship with an institution in countries outside of the EEA and are fundraising with them and essentially are sharing personal data to achieve that. The key thing is to you look at transfers of data and see if any do go outside the EEA. And if so, assess your options. As I said, if you really have to rely on individual consent, that's the only basis that you think can legitimise that transfer. Rather than undertaking your own assessment or having a contract, then you would need to consider seeking that individual's consent at the next available opportunity. I would certainly approach it with a risk-based uh, mindset. You're weighing up the fact that if nobody is complaining now, then you probably aren't doing too much that's wrong, but you've got to assess that against the fact that individuals do have increasing expectations when it comes to the management of their personal information, their privacy rights, their expectations on information security. Be conscious of uh, the ease with which you can become the focus of you know, a social media storm. By that I mean you know, a little story about non-compliance can easily become mainstream via Twitter or social media. You know, for example, someone tweeting a screenshot of the zany fundraising mailing they received or, or complaining or flagging up that they've tried to opt out and they just can't seem to stop getting this marketing material. And ultimately, always consider the impact of non-compliance and what this might mean to your reputation. I would certainly look to document your thought process, you know, the decisions you make, as this clearly demonstrates you are aware of the risks and have considered remedial action and either taken that action, are planning to take it, or have agreed that the level of risk is acceptable at this time. And the point is you are looking at the issues and as a, as a management team, taking those informed decisions, planning out how you're gonna look at the issues and the risk. My final point will be to take complaints seriously. A company called uh, Parklife Weekender who were running an event in Manchester, certainly did not do this. They had a text-based marketing campaign, which had text show up as if they had come from mum rather than park life itself. No doubt hoping that more people would open the uh, text. Uh, when people complained, i.e. those people who had recently lost their mothers or whose mothers were in a home or a coma and clearly couldn't have text the message, Part Life Weekend did not take these complaints seriously. On the screen, you'll see a quote from the Information Commissioner's Office fine. As you can see, uh, the company uh, tweeted out comparing themselves to Marmite rather than taking the issue seriously. So ultimately, you need to get into a position where you can answer with conviction and clarity any queries that are coming from individuals with the knowledge that all the issues have been considered and a balanced position has been reached because you want to strike a balance between you know, innovative, clever, quirky fundraising ideas and the requirements of the law. Ultimately, you should obviously be trying to avoid getting people's backs up or freaking them out about who has access to their information and what they're using it for. Imagine my hypothetical example here of a really uh, personalised email arriving in your inbox. Would you donate to that? Would you be engaging with that? Or would you complain? Uh, to give you some real life examples rather than my hypothetical ones, uh, this one's from a train company who, you know, you could argue despite being technically compliant because post marketing is opt out and email marketing is opt in, I think they actually fail in my 
a view uh, on the whole sort of fairness question. You know, am I really likely to read this very small print at the end of the application form? Am I likely to spot the subtle dropping of the not from the second line? And it's worth asking whether such a form actually achieves its goals. Am I likely to be an engaged potential future customer if this is how our relationship starts? I, I question whether that would work, whether it achieves its objectives. And this one from the Virgin Group. I must have read it 10 times before being sure how to exercise my marketing choice. I shouldn't have to uh, have a degree in double negatives in order to do that. It seems like it's been a bit too clever for my, for my liking. Similar sorts of thoughts are with other potential marketing activities. So market research. If it is purely market research, you have no advertising or marketing material, then the Data Protection Act, the privacy regs will not apply. But you clearly shouldn't be tempted to simply label your marketing as a survey or engage in subbing, not trying to fundraise under the pretext of conducting some research. Same sort of issues when it comes to newsletters and inserts. You might have a newsletter that contains some marketing, or you might want to include a marketing insert along with a newsletter. Really, in both cases, it comes down to common sense. If your newsletter actually contains you know, only 10% news and 90% marketing, you're likely to be pushing at the boundaries of what's fair and what people might reasonably expect to have received. I think this could be seen as marketing rather than a newsletter. And the same with inserts. If you have one newsletter but stuffed in 10 inserts full of marketing, then you're likely to you know, increase the likelihood of someone complaining and this, that this is not what they signed up for. So a lot of this is hopefully common sense. It's, it's saying, look, look at the different ways of marketing and make sure we're conscious of being fair, open, transparent, and accountable for what we're looking to do. Just to summarize some of the other uh, marketing areas, as we mentioned earlier, direct marketing, direct mail, postal mail can be opt out. Phone calls must be opt out and you must screen them against the telephone preference service. And automated calls where there's a recorded voice comes out at the end of the line, these are opt in. Uh, but the more important one, I think it's most common now we're looking at here is email and text. And this is interesting. I think the, the, certainly the fundraising sector is on a bit of a journey when it comes to uh, email and text. Uh, certainly regulation 22 of the privacy regs is pretty clear. You do need specific opt-in uh, consent to send unsolicited direct marketing. So you should be aiming for interesting, innovative content to get individuals who actively want to engage with you. You'll see lots of examples of this, but a, a pre-text box or someone not uh, opting out, these are both not consent. They are not an active uh, provision of consent. You know, relying on someone missing a tick box, not taking any action, misunderstanding what they were agreeing to, agreeing to, these are not consent, and you could argue they're not a good basis to start your relationship with a potential donor. It's not a good way to start that relationship. So, hopefully that's given you an overview of the different uh, ways of marketing, the different issues that the different formats of marketing can bring up. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, it's having, uh, you know, increasingly important to have some proof, some record of consent, some clarity on uh, you know, when you collected the information, when it was, how they consented, where did the consent come from. You know, being able to prove this and demonstrate this is, is increasingly important. The, the story with uh, Olive Cook recently, you know, the questions were asked to the, lots of charities, were you sending this lady marketing, fundraising material? How often were you contacting her? The ones that couldn't quickly answer that question you could argue, you know, fared pretty badly in the press. The fact that the article was written, it would say this charity could not tell us how often they communicated with Mrs. Cook. They didn't know or they couldn't answer the question quickly 
you know, stood them in a bad light, I think. So having this data, having this evidence is critical. And it's the same for when you buy in a list of data. It's due diligence. It's asking questions of the list broker or whoever else you're getting the data from, asking them about the quality of the data. You know, good list brokers will want to show off how good their data is, that it was obtained with clear consent, that there was double opt-in to the marketing, various things like that. So certainly having some due diligence before you procure that data is, again, becoming more and more important. Uh, so the bottom line, whether you're starting out now or working on what you've got, is always to be thinking, you know, is what we're doing or planning to do, is it what the individuals are likely to expect and be happy with us doing? You know, might it trigger complaints? If there were complaints, you know, what would be our answer? If there is a degree of risk, are we willing to accept that level of risk? Do we have a plan to maybe mitigate that risk further as we move on down a particular project or change a particular system? do a new mail out, you, know, you can have a plan to try and increase the level of compliance as you move forward. I mean, it is true that, you know, privacy issues and the use of personal information do not at present feature highly on the Fundraising Standards Board annual survey of complaints. But as I said, the Olive story shows and the recent charity fundraising stories have demonstrated that getting this right is able to demonstrate that you've thought about the issues and reached an informed decision this is fast becoming critical to protect your reputation and to enable you to still use personal data in a, an efficient, effective way to fundraise. Uh, my last uh, two points really uh, confirm this. Uh, just to show you uh, what happened with that Part Life Weekender uh, company, 70,000 texts uh, sent out, uh, pretending to be people's mums rather than identifying themselves clearly. Well, they were fined £70,000 for that uh, serious breach of the privacy regs because they should have known it was an issue and went ahead and mass, you know, hid, hid their identity, causing great distress for a number of individuals. And a few months ago, the ICO, the Information Commissioner, got greater powers to issue fines of up to half a million pounds for serious breaches of the regulations. They do not now have to prove substantial distress has been caused by nuisance calls and nuisance texts, just that the serious breach of the regulations has occurred. So previously, the ICO was uh, struggling to get convictions because they had to show substantial distress had been caused to individuals, where in actual fact, most, most marketing might be annoying or distressing, but it might not be substantially distressing. So that higher threshold has been removed. The Information Commissioner is quite happy about this and we'll see more of its attempted conviction stick, more of its spine stick, when it comes to looking at the privacy and electronic uh, regulation. So, uh, thank you for listening. I hope that's been a, a useful overview of the various data protection and privacy reg issues to consider when fundraising, particularly when, fu when fundraising abroad. Uh, like I said, we're, we're Protector, we're a data protection based support subscription-based data protection service. We're offering free policy reviews at the moment to organizations where we give your current policy and approach a once over and present the findings to you. Uh, we're also offering a 20% discount on, on subscriptions taken uh, before the end of August. Please do take a moment to visit our website, protector.org.uk to find out more. And uh, I look forward to yeah, answering any questions or queries that, uh, that you may have. Thank you very much.